let me introduce you here to Daria. She works uh, here at EPFL, uh, and she has a very interesting uh, perspective. We talked about she worked with biomimicry that she's going to uh, explain to you guys. Uh, how many of you know what biomimicry means, actually? Yeah. Anybody online? Good, and still you came. I, I didn't know, I wasn't familiar with the name of it as well, um, and, and it's something new. Maybe you can explain better than me, but... What I what I'm try what I usually say is that to try to find a way in our case how we can think of business technology and ourselves how we live in a way that follows the evolution that it can continue to be pertinent the same way as the evolution theory had it back then is this more or less something like that you you just go to one of my last slides so that's like kind of the, the uh. most complex way you can go. But uh, that means maybe that you, you got it. But yes, I will, I will get there gradually. Yes, yeah, so this is it. So I guess that without further attention, uh, introduction, so I don't ruin the rest of the presentation, here's Daria, guys. So thank, uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all the people streaming that, uh, that are joining. Uh, maybe just a brief uh, introduction uh, of, of myself, what I do, and how I arrived at EPFL. Um, I'm not in the frame, but then I'm not saying, uh, so I'm a biologist. Um, I specialize, uh, especially during my studies and PhD and so on, in studying interactions between individuals. Why do some individuals compete? Why do some individuals cooperate? And then how does these two dynamics um, kind of uh, equilibrate within a single system? And um, I studied uh, biology always from a very interdisciplinary point of view, meaning that we were always mathematicians, physicists, and biologists studying a single topic. And so when we came, um, when I was going deeper and deeper into this cooperative and competitive interactions, I realized how much we humans are social species and how much we humans as a social species, species can learn from other social species out there. And um, so at the end of my PhD, uh, I decided to go even further into that development, into that field of how nature and humans can reconnect, uh, knowing that we really share the same patterns, the same behaviors, and that very deeply when you go into the mathematical explanations of how we do it, why we do it, and, and the same thing for nature, that it's actually the same thing, meaning that the solutions are very often also the same. And this is how I arrived at EPFL five to six months ago uh, to start uh, uh, develop even further, not my own research, but at the, at the, at the level of EPFL, all of the research projects that are going in that direction, and then also uh, develop a bit more education in that direction, knowing that this is a very interdisciplinary field and, and it needs specific teaching. Um, and then also, if possible, uh, connect research to industry, because the beautiful thing of industry is this, that actually um, gives the opportunity for that research to have the impact in the society. Um, so within the EPFL, we, oops, we now have a website it's called bioinspired.epfl.ch, where you can find all of the information and context of what we do. Um, as evolutionary biologists, uh, we always start asking, our favorite question is why? Why is grass green? Why do some individuals compete for either cooperate, as in my PhD? And so I would also really like to start, for me, this why is a very important thing, okay? Looking at nature as an inspiration for innovation can be fun, but is it something more than just fun? And then going really into why should we do it uh, and why should we care how nature designs things? And for that, um, I would like to see how do we actually design things. And uh, very simplistically, um, we design things in order to provide comfort to, to us humans, in order to protect us from external factors, in, in order to, to control environment in certain way, in order to, to provide us with, um, with all the kind of um, 
things that our material bodies maybe are not capable of doing. And that's all fine, and I enjoy all of these things as much as you do, so I'm not uh, here to tell you that you should not be taking planes anymore. Uh, um, but then what's very important in CES is how do we design these end products that are so nice for us? And this is where this process of how do we design things actually also come to, to a point. And we design all of these things that provide us with comfort, but at the same time intoxicate our society uh, and the environment. Um, knowing that today talking about climate change and all the other social problems that are out there, it's really not a taboo anymore, and I will not even go more in details on that one. Um, and just really to illustrate how much this way that we design things, and especially in the, in the, the way that we design processes, um, is, uh, is malfunctional. Uh, this is a way that we, uh, this is a very simplistic uh, chain of our food systems. So how do we produce food? When you really go, apart from the fact that we're already looking at it like this, it's not a nice picture. When you go into the, the mathematical of equations of what does this whole chain mean and uh, how much energy is actually uh, turned over within that system, you can actually, uh, you can have these data which show that in order to produce one calorie of food, seven calories of food need to be injected in the system as a form of energy. Then if you add that one third of that food actually goes to waste, even when it reaches our plates, that's like you need to inject 22 calories of energy to produce two calories of food. And this is from an from a energetical, mathematical point of view, a system that's not functioning in a good way as, as much as we uh, enjoy eating that food at the end. But at one point saying that, um, uh, money will not be here all the time to equilibrate these equations because this is money in our systems is energy. So money, we design this system in a way that money does equilibrate this energetical equation, but up to which point will money uh, be, uh, be equilibrating this, this, uh, these equations. And then when you go even deeper into just this very simple system, uh, we know uh, what are the uh, social and environmental problems that are kind of the imprint of that system. Uh, and then it becomes a really holistic story. And this is the story that we now are starting to, to look at because now we are starting to be, now the problem of, of how will 9 million people live on this planet using these same pathways that we for a long time uh, kind of got away with because just because of the, the quantity of the people that was on the planet. Knowing that, uh, so now, uh, I mean, I'm start reading these articles and now like, how will we drink coffee in 2015? I'm like, what, what's the problem with coffee? I mean, uh, like, I don't see a problem. It's like, uh, it, it's plant, it grows. Because there is the thing is that there is the no, no space to produce coffee for 9 billion people in 2050 with the way we are producing it. So we, since we cannot give up of this comfort and very philosophically and also biologically evolutionary regression is something that's very difficult to happen. Usually it happens in times of catastrophes. It does not time. It's not a planned, uh, planned event. So, we, so, we, so since we cannot change the way we de, uh, change that comfort, that end product that we got so much dependent on, uh, sorry, huh? <laughs> uh, we need to start changing the way we design things. From really literary, we need to start changing the way we design things. And now the question is, uh, how, how can we start changing? How can we design things differently? Okay. And for that, I kind of invite you really to zoom, uh, to zoom out. And with having this perspective, really ask, ask yourselves, are we really the only species on this planet? Are we really the only species on this planet that are trying to figure out how to stay alive? Are we really the only species on this planet that are trying to figure out how to fly, how to manage complex systems? Are we really so special and unique? And, and kind of to answer that question in also that zoomed in perspective, uh, if we look at the evolution of life, knowing that we are not the only species on this planet,
the 8.5 8 million species today inhabit this planet. Uh, and if we plot that evolution of, of life um, on a time frame of a single day, life uh, evolved um, early morning. It developed, it took time to develop. It was not a, 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 a high speed process. At one point it became, humans appeared one second before midnight. Uh, the 200 years of our industrial revolution, that's kind of really the end, res the, the result of everything that's going on today, is just a, really a millisecond of what, um, of, our, of our being here on that planet. Uh, there are species living today that are 3.8 billion years old, uh, that are 2 billion, two, that, have, that are 2 billion years old, that are 1 billion, that are 500 million years. We are, two, we are doing this for 200 years, okay? We are not the only and we are not the first organism that's asking these questions. Um, so now this kind of how becomes, how does nature then do all of these things, okay? And uh, this is a very interesting study from 2006. Uh, that looked at patterns that nature uses to design things. Um, and it, it shows that nature uh, design things and then also by designing things solve problems. Um, by using the least amount of energy, which is so in red, and substance, which are materials and resources, in yellow. Uh, because these are extremely costly. It solves problems by using, th using um, things such as information, time, space, and structure. Okay. Uh, that same study also showed how do we humans design things. Okay. Uh, very, very opposite way of designing things. Uh, we are very familiar of uh, the use of energy and, and substance uh, when we want to design new functions, with, when we want to enhance current functions. Uh, we don't use, we use very little amount of information, um, time, space, and structure to design things. So th this is, this was a very, very important, this is a very important study because it doesn't, it's first it shows that nature designed things in a way that are profoundly different from the way we design things. Not taking any sides, so this is not who designs better, this is just who designs in which way. And then it seems that it designs things in a way that we now want to start designing things because we are realizing that from an energy point of view, uh, we are heading to a catastrophe if we continue doing it like this. We will not, but uh, just to... Uh, and then also from the way, of, of the way we are using resources uh, today uh, and materials and energy being one of that, that resources is also just showing how, um, uh, how much we want to design as nature does now. So this is uh, one example just to illustrate that point. This is um, an organism that lives in the sea. It's called a glass spongy. It's called glass spongy because what you see, it's a skeleton built out of glass. So it creates glass uh, at the bottom of the sea in water uh, at room temperatures and uh, let, let, let's say it's from room pressures also. Uh, compared to what, what we use as pressures in our uh, production system. This is how we design glass. Uh, in order to make glass, uh, we use 1,500 to 1,700 degrees Celsius. Okay. Uh, what's even worse, uh, as, as, I mean, the, the picture says it uh, quite a lot, uh, since we use these huge temperatures to create this glass, that, uh, of course, creates huge amount of heat. And then we need to, in, to, to create new machines with new energies to, to, to cool the system down. Uh, so really, to, to, to just to point out that, that cyclic and that how that energy just adds up in the system. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm doing with that. Uh, but <laughs> the presentation has its own life. Uh, so biomimicry, which uh, is called innovation inspired by nature, is then asking, how can we, uh, since we are such a smart species, uh, I don't know, 
Can we put stop? I need to talk faster. Uh, how can we start designing glasses the way Glass Spongy does? And then even more, uh, how can we um, add up on that and create glasses that is not just uh, uh, designed at, at, in water and in room temperature, but it has this, for example, self-cleaning and self-healing abilities. And this is where, for example, these two properties and, and, and Professor Letarier and Michaud uh, are working at EPFL on these properties. This is where material sciences are now really, uh, really starting to hit. How do you create materials that self-clean? That's inspired by the lotus leaf that has this nanostructure surface that's, that's, not, that's hydrophobic in a way that when water falls, it rolls down and by rolling down, it captures all of the waste and then it cleans the surface. So when it rains, your windows would be clean. Uh, same thing with very similar, I mean, no, it's not very similar, but similar thinking with self-healing materials. And this is also this, all this, I'm sorry, of, uh, of materials becoming as, as a skin, knowing that the skin is a very complex system and one of the remarkable uh, capabilities of skin is that it can, it can heal. So how do you create a glass that when a crack occurs, you don't need to replace it, but it, it heals itself, okay? And this is really the research uh, that's going on uh, at EPFL and many other institutions now. Um, so now kind of also to fill a bit more that question of how does nature, there's these three main levels uh, at which uh, we, we can start uh, nature design things and also we can start designing things. So it's form, function and systems. And also kind of the, 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 the follow-up of the presentation will be a few examples of each of these levels. Uh, also knowing that I was told that in this room there will be some uh, designers, engineers, and uh, management people. So I think that each one of them may be a bit more interesting in, each, uh, in some of these levels. Um, so to start with form, uh, very important uh, in nature, Form follows function, meaning that uh, every form uh, that is there in the nature is there either to create a function or to enhance an existing function. Form in nature, even though it becomes something very beautiful, it's not there to be beautiful. Form is there because it has a purpose within the function. Um, uh, our designers are always very uh, afraid of using, and I, I've spoke to a lot of architects mainly, um, that, that will tell you this phrase by far, heart, form follows function, form follows function, but then they don't design anything as form follows function because that's uh, destroying their own uh, creative process, and that's kind of putting them these two big boundaries. But when you see that life has 8.5 billion species that most none of them look the same, I think that gives kind of the space for that creative process as well as the, the, that coupling between form and function. And so I will uh, just make a point uh, on this um, aerodynamic and hydrodynamic forms because this is just the most intuitive knowing that I don't have a lot of time. Um, so this is a very simple diagram of how uh, different form react when put in different medium. Uh, no surprises today. Uh, so knowing that there are certain these spherical forms that are that are um, that affect that uh, the the fluid that goes around them goes with the least amount of drag and friction, which then facilitates the movement of the object in the medium. Um, this is how, and the CD is the is the coefficient of drag, meaning the uh, the more you are moving fluidly in the in the medium, the less of your coefficient of drag is. Um, so this is just on cars. I am I'm not a specialist here. I mean, I, mean, I did research on drugs and uh, hydrodynamics and aerodynamics, but uh, this is the, the co uh, drag uh, coefficients of the way we design cars, and this is the drag coefficients of of animals that actually live in the medium and that uh, uh, that move in this medium every day, and whose whose movement depends on on that, uh, whose, whose survival depends on that movement. Um, this is the uh, Volkswagen's um, new car, and they are bragging that it is the car with the least uh, uh, drag coefficient, which may be true for, for us, but then when you compare it to the way other animals 
uh, use form to to reduce drag, it becomes almost ridiculous. Ri ridiculous. Um, so now this, and, and why this is important is because, to, so remember, our biggest challenge in this uh, next 50 years is energy. Reducing drag, meaning creating a system that moves more efficiently in the medium, meaning it uh, achieves the same speed using less amount of energy, okay? Um, so now all of these companies are now starting to, to design these things in order to even uh, a normal car to have like an everyday car to have that shape that makes it more energy efficient, uh, having these more uh, spherical shapes. Uh, this Japanese high-speed train is one of the most famous examples uh, of biomimicry, so I'll let you Google that one up. Uh, Mercedes-Benz car inspired by a fish. Um, there is Dario Floreano at EPFL who is uh, working on um, flying robotics. Uh, this is just one of the startups uh, that created that drones and that's now, um, that's now selling them, inspired by, um, by the way insects fly. And then these two, uh, these are not, these are future, these are uh, kind of models of future planes. These are not uh, military planes. These are future planes that are made to transport people. Uh, from, uh, so this is how uh, we should now start imagining planes with maximum energy efficiency, knowing that in plane industry, when you reduce the energy for like 1%, you're not saving only billions of dollars uh, as a company, but uh, you're emitting uh, <laughs> oh no, I'm not. Can I continue or? Okay, so you're by, by reducing the uh, uh, energy consumption in one by just one percent, you're you're reducing um, the CO2 emission by billions of tons. Okay, so plane industry um, uh, is very will be an important player here. Um, here, since I don't have time to go into to all of the magnificent forms in nature, I just made a kind of a, a an, at, at the end of each section there will be this slide just to invite you to start now questioning. Okay. So how does nature use form to package things in an efficient way? How does nature use its form to couple development and growth? We would not think that to couple development and growth we need form, but actually this is uh, what nature does in many examples. How does nature use form to release stress um, and such things? So this is really an invitation for you to continue. Um, next level, functions. How does nature create functions? And this is just the most uh, picturesque way of, uh, of function, this is how does nature create color? So one uh, mainstream way that we know that nature creates color is by pigments, and that's true. Nature also creates color by using structure, it's something that's called structural colors. By changing the nanostructure of a material, uh, you make a material, you make a light reflect at certain wavelengths and that these wavelengths give color, okay? All of these colors here that you see are structural colors, no pigments, no, and we uh, in, in, in our human society, pigments are usually quite toxic and make huge problems uh, from the, for, for the recycling companies. Um, okay, so uh, color, uh, color created by structure. Uh, lots of insects, birds, and even fish use that, um, use that function, or use that capacity to create colors. So this is just a two examples. Um, uh, one is, uh, I very, I, like yesterday, I discovered that actually there is huge amount of research at EPFL going on, the, on, on these structural colors. I mainly met uh, with uh, Professor Jürgen Brugge from Microsystems Laboratory, who is working a lot on, the, on these kind of things. And Morphotonics is a startup, actually, that that is doing these things and that's a part of his lab. Um, so apart from uh, printing nice colors on chocolate uh, by changing the structure of the chocolate, uh, they're also now using it uh, to print this uh, kind of a security stamps, which is a stamp actually that since it's made, 
uh, by changing the nano structure of the raw material, it's something that cannot be uh, recreated. So it's kind of more to to protect the brands. Um, then there is also like really looking how where can this uh, lead uh, lead us is uh, there was this very nice paper from 2015 but there is lots of research done on this how can we use this, this to create printers that don't use any ink but you print when it, the, that paper or whatever goes into printing it's changing the nanostructure of material not injecting the ink inside of the material this could be really really cool stuff um, the second way that nature creates these colors without structure, and this is the, the way chame chame chameleons uh, do that. So chameleons have these photonic crystals inside of their, uh, their skin. This is how it looks like. So it's a, it's a 3D matrix of photonic crystals that the arrangement of, of these crystals decides which colors will get reflected and which will pass through the, through the material. And this is how chameleons have its color. This is how chameleons then, by changing the the positioning of these nano uh, of these uh, photonic crystals, you change which light gets reflected. So you, this is how chameleon changes color uh, by changing the, the organization of the photonic crystals in its skin. You would not have thought about that, <laughs> but it's really really cool. This is one of my my favorite uh, papers from last year. But this is my scientific geeky things. <laughs> and so this is really nice. Uh, Qualcomm Mirasol is a, is a company that use that principle uh, to create screens that don't emit colors, but reflect colors. Uh, and in this way, uh, it's, it's saving huge amount of energy on the, on the, on the um, for example, the, the tablets because you don't inject energy in order to meet that colors you just the the, the screen by itself is there to, to reflect colors um ah, so this is uh, just a very funny one that came uh, to my mind uh, while i was looking actually at the this uh, spheric camera that you have for home mo monitoring because circle okay okay and and I was like, ah, oh, but why does why cannot we see like what's going on all around the house from one camera, but just from one you have just one kind of angle, and then uh, I mean I mean I'm doing this just to illustrate the way biomimicry works, and I was like, ah, oh, but how does nature see 360? It cannot be so difficult, and then um, uh, there is this three strategies that just came up to my mind because I'm a biologist, so it's of course it's normal that it's a bit easier for me. Uh, but there is this oval strategy. Ovals have this amazing ability that they can rotate their heads in all directions. So physiologically, it's something that we're all now studying because we cannot do more than that. Okay, so they can do it in all directions. Um, chameleons, uh, kind, of, kind of the chameleon strategy is having these two eyes that rotate independently in, order, in all directions and that, that then form this holistic image. And then there is the insect eye strategy where you have kind of this lots of these small visual receptors uh, on both eyes in all direction that are static, but that together form this holistic image. And actually at EPFL, there is a scientist that are working on this insect eye inspired cameras for high definition uh, imaging. And then other, again, an invitation for you to continue uh, asking these questions. And here are just some of them. How does nature amplify sound? How does nature see underwater? Uh, can we make better glasses for, for diving? Uh, how does nature attach? I mean, the, the gecko, I will not go into that. That's the most common example you will see from biomimicry. Um, and so the last one is how does nature create systems? Because we saw that, yes, we need to change the way we design products, but mainly what we need to change is the way we design this, the whole systems, whole processing systems, and then also city systems and all of these kind of things. And this is one of the like very early uh, pictures or schemas that you see when you're a biology student and that you learn that uh, in nature, everything is a unit and a system at the same time. Um, so in order, for, for example, your, your the cells in your body have been created when two bacteria merge together in one single system. Um, these cells were then merged in a multicellular organism 
that is your body. Your body is a very efficient individual, but above everything, it's a very, very efficient system. Uh, and we need to start thinking of all of this, then also just to make a parallel with the way we produce things. Everything is, a, is an individual, but it is, it is also the system, and it needs to be integrated and functioning well in that system's level. And, um, and, and for example, cancer cells, which are really terrible, are the cells or, or the individuals in the systems that decided to work for, in, for their individual benefits, short-term benefits, and not for the long-term benefits of the systems. I'm an evolutionary biologist. As evolutionary biologist, is what we call a cheating cell, a cell that cheats on the systems because it takes, it, uh, takes for its individual benefits what the system is producing. And we all know in a very, very sad way what cancer cells does to our body, but in the same that way, they kill themselves. Okay, so just thinking, and, and, and in today's world, we are really functioning a lot on these short-term short -term individual benefits and forgetting to look at long-term systems benefits. And, um, and, and this is where nature, I think, has the most to teach us because this is where we are the weakest also at the moment. Um, uh, one very efficient system uh, from, very, from a computational point of view is brain. And although we have created uh, machines that now can have bigger computational power than brain does, they do that using 10 times more energy. So when you normalize that, then, uh, our, our computers could not function at all using the energy that our brain is using. And our brain is meaning that, given the point up to which, uh, which level our brain is actually a very strong computational system. And now uh, all of the, uh, these companies that are producing these microchips and, and developing this thing are now starting to look at, at actually how does brain work. Uh, not only because it can pr produce huge amount of, of computation using very low amount of function, and it does that um, by using its whole space in certain way. Our, our microchips are, for example, um, uh, very uh, uh, actually don't use most of the space that they that they have, and that's one of the biggest problems. So, how do you start using? Uh, in a more efficient way, a system that uh, shuffles information, repairs itself, uh, and maintains itself at the same time. Uh, and then the Blaine Broom project that just across the street uh, is, is, is working a lot on, on, on that thing. Uh, another uh, system's point of view uh, problem is networks. System we awfully mathematically represent it as a network. Um, these two networks are actually uh, it's the same points connected in a bit different way. Actually, the both, the, both network, well, networks are presented with the same problem of how do you uh, connect all the dots in the most optimal way. Um, the two networks were designed by very different means. Uh, on, the, on the right, actually, it is a, a train a network in Tokyo, one that's thought to be one of the most efficient train networks out there. And on the, um, on the left, it's that same network design in a couple of hours by slime mold. Uh, it's a unicellular organism that when it grows, the cells stick together and form this uh, sticky, slimy uh, organism that you see on the, uh, 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 down there. And I have a movie that shows how do they do that. Um, yeah, so just a second, if you can wait. So this is the slime mold uh, in the center, and then the, the white spots are actually sugar because it likes sugar, so this is where it like, would like to go. Um, and we're, we will try to, they, they simply put slime mold in the center and then see how it will reach all the, all the sugar points, which are their energy points. And, and cities are in many ways uh, our energy, energy points, if you can. Okay, so it's, at the beginning it starts spreading in all directions in the same way, uh, not knowing which is the best path. And then little by little, some of the paths start, uh, are suppressed 
and others are reinforced in order to create a network at the end. So by studying these networks, scientists have realized that they uh, are actually extremely good in computing this uh, linear mathematical algebraic problems that I have nothing to know, that I don't know anything about. Uh, uh, but um, the computational power of this very, very, we would call primitive organism. In biology, we don't, we learn that no one is, nothing is primitive. It's just evolved more or, uh, it's more or less complex, let's say. Very, very, so very, very simple organism uh, has the power that our computers may not have yet achieved. And this is a, an EPFL researcher, uh, Nashiti Vishnoi, I hope I, I pronounce well, that says in one of his articles, and he's really studying this system, he's a mathematician and computational scientist, that there is a tantalizing possibility that nature, via evolution, developed algorithms that effectively solve some of the most complex computational problems about billions of years before we did. Okay. Very, very powerful uh, sentence also very powerful um, for him, uh, um, really feeling uh, that nature actually already solved it. Okay? And we're just here to kind of understand maybe how they did that. Uh, he's also studying the way evolution works, because evolution is actually how do you solve a problem, okay? You have a new environment, how do you adapt to it? How do you solve that problem? How do you solve it in a very efficient way, knowing that energy and materials are costly? So he's also uh, looking at the mathemati mathematics of evolution and then also trying to apply that to, um, to the way um, we can now um, develop our own products. And then there are these things called genetic algorithms and evolutionary alg algorithms and many, but more and more companies are now using them a lot to quickly solve uh, especially technical problems. <sighs> Another invitation just to continue questioning, uh, how does nature manage diversity? How does nature innovate while uh, preserving integrity? Uh, how does nature adapt to uncertainty? That was one of the main uh, questions of my PhD, knowing that cooperation is one of the, um, the ways that, that we adapt in certain, to, to, to uncertainty. Uh, to come back to kind of the, the beginning of the presentations, nature, there, there are these three levels that, which we, that, we, that we can use to kind of solve and uh, design better our own systems at level of forms, functions, and, and systems, which is the most complex and the most difficult. Um, we are really living in a period of change. We kind of all now know that we need to start changing the way we make things, the way we do things, the way we design things. Um, change, is, change is good, change is uh, opportunity. I think that we really need to start seeing it like that. And also, I think we need to come to a kind of a common ground point of that change needs to happen through something that I call good design. I really don't care anymore if something is green design, if you're an environmentalist, if you are a humanitarian and you care for people, if you are really into human-centered design. I'm also into human-centered design, but, but that's, that's not the point. The point is that whatever design, that we need to start aiming for something that's good design. And good design is above all of these concepts. Um, good design is something that does not kill while producing. Good design is sometimes that don't demand more energy to inject than, than uh, the energy that's, that's exiting the system. Good design is something that's not intoxicating. And there is even this uh, a very nice article from a from a, uh, from a museum, um, I think it was in Boston, that says that, that good design should be a human right. Because good design uh, is a mean of, of putting all of that human's rights into place, bringing them into place, okay? And then knowing that we are nature, okay, this is something that we also forget. What's good design for us will also be good design for the environment and for nature. Um, just a few resources, if a mean of getting to that good design is getting an inspiration from nature and biomimicry, uh, at EPFL, I'm just cross, uh, across the street, don't hesitate to contact me, there is also a website, asknature.org, uh, 
is a, is a magnificent, magnificent online open source catalog of nature's solutions to human design challenges. And it really has this way of, it has, says, how, how does nature, and then you type whatever you would like to, to, to know. Uh, and then also the, the consulting agencies, uh, and mainly they're more uh, local also think tanks, uh, function as local think tanks that kind of uh, provide information about all of this. Um, and just to finish kind of with this picture of, of rainforest, uh, which is the most abundant um, and diverse place on earth. Um, and, uh, and just to know that the change is happening, we need to start thinking in different ways, but, uh, but we are not alone in doing that. That's where I will finish. Thanks a lot. Can you just come a little bit here so then everybody can see you? Yeah, that was fascinating. Thank you. Um, guys, if you're online, everybody would like to ask a question. You can unmute yourselves. Uh, meanwhile, do we have any questions here at the Big to Daria? Well, I just can't remember the name of the species that they used for the, the train mapping, like in Japan. If we use another species, would it work the same or would it be different? How do we know that this species was the more efficient in growing these little tentacles? Oh, we don't know. That's really what's fun with biomimicry. You really feel like you're uh, starting to be Leonardo da Vinci and you're discovering a whole new thing. There are 8.5 million species. We don't know. Uh, uh, we don't know well most of them. I think they use the Fisarium uh, as a species of slime mold just because it's a species of slime mold that's used in labs and it worked. Uh, then uh, there is uh, quite a lot of species of slime molds. Then maybe we have time to, to test them all. Uh, but um, I'm not sure. I don't know if they used other species of slime mold. Hmm. Yeah, but it's possible that some of them have uh, better, even better mechanisms of, of computing these things. Hello, uh, just a little bit comment on some comparison you do between what nature does and what uh, human does. Sometimes you do not compare apples with apples, like you compare uh, cars with animals that go in, in the water. So you should better compare submarines with uh, water animals and, and a cheetah, for example, that goes to the same speed as a, as a car. Can I respond? Okay, great. <laughs> If you want to, uh, um, actually, um, so Mercedes-Benz used the fish as uh, as an inspiration for their um, for their car, just because the form. Uh, I think that mathematically, it's a, it's a form that goes through the medium and receives a drug. Yes, um, there is a different dynamics in water and in air, so, or, or let's say in liquid and in gas. Um, actually, there are more and more examples that show that, that one works also well into, into the, in, in another. There are now water mills, um, or no, water mill, wind turbines, I'm sorry. Wind turbines that are using the, the fins of whales, because the fins of whales very, very nicely in water and have this attack angle that's much more, uh, that have this increased range of attack angles. So now they put the, the design of a whale fin on a windmill in order for it to be able to catch um, different um, uh, wind going in different angles. So the, uh, in a simplified way, the dynamics are comparable especially in and hydrodynamics and aerodynamics, you really now see the comparisons. I mean, you have planes that now have shark skin because shark skin at a nanoscale has, is one of the most efficient drug reducing um, uh, materials. So they actually reproduced that, that shark skin material, put it on an airplane 
in order for it to reduce, uh, it, it, it didn't produce huge amount of um, energy, uh, uh, energy reduction, it was 1%, but as I said, for plain industry, that's huge. Uh, so I, I did that uh, by, by purpose, and, uh, and also uh, I think that um, where the power, when, where the, all the intelligence of us as human comes is actually in mixing all of these systems and knowing how to mix that systems in order to increase even more what nature can do. I guess that online here, um, there are no questions as well. So last time I wanted to thank you. It was very good. Thanks for putting circle into your presentation as well. It was very cool. It's something that we talk about often is how, really? it, okay. how we can see everything in a more direct way. Okay. So okay. thank you very much and it was great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.